Jean Grier painted this extremely rosy picture of Spark. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to tell about the, yeah, the cold, harsh reality of it. Let me see. Does this work? Um, so my name is Sandy. Um, just quickly about me. Uh, I work at Cloudera. We uh, make Hadoop, and now we also uh, uh, help make Spark a little bit. Um, I uh, do data science there. Uh, I sort of led our initial like Spark development. Um, before that, I was uh, making Hadoop stuff. Um, so before I start, raise your hand if you ever tried to write a Spark job. OK, a few people. Um, for the rest of you, I don't know. It might still be entertaining. Um, so this is, this is something that uh, one of my colleagues uh, sent to me recently. This is a, uh, uh, he was trying to run a Spark job, and it was this error that he hit. Um, and there seemed to be, there's this like IWC character who comes up a lot, and then there's like a lot of money, and, <laughs> and uh, an anonymous fun. So, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty much, pretty much every day, you know, we at Cloudera have customers running Spark, and they send us some like uh, uh, thing like this, and we have to try to figure out what's going wrong. Um, uh, Spark, you know about it uh, so far. So I like to um, sort of optimistically look at these uh, these errors as uh, sort of sort of like manholes. Um, and manholes in the sense that uh, they're, they're just hanging out. You don't really notice them until something really crazy happens. Um, and it sucks that the manhole explodes, but also you have this nice little portal um, into uh, the uh, internals of the Earth, and you get to sort of go down there uh, and use it as an opportunity to, to understand what's going on. So, okay. This is, uh, this is probably, if you're running a Spark job, the most, the most common error that you will, uh, that you'll ever hit. Um, and there's lots, of, there's lots of text here. I think yeah, IWC is back, and it's anonymous fun guy. Um, so so, so what's, what's actually happening here? Um, if, we, if we cut away uh, some of the cruft, we get this. And in particular, uh, there are these three, uh, there's three words at the top that seem very important. And what's interesting about these words is that uh, when you actually write a Spark job, as we, as we saw before, beautifully uh, demonstrated by Jean Gris, um, you see a lot of words, but these words are not any of those words, uh, yet they seem to be very important to why your day is being ruined. Um, so, so let's dive a little bit into what they actually mean and what's going on. Um, so here's uh, sort of your uh, canonical, really simple Spark program. Uh, you're reading a text file. You're filtering out every line um, that does not start with banana, and then you're counting, uh, you're counting the number of lines there. Um, so th those, those top two lines where you uh, read the text file uh, and you do this filter, uh, there you're sort of defining these, uh, these logical operations um, that describe the flow of what to do with your data. Um, by the time that those two top lines have uh, finished executing, nothing is actually uh, happened on your cluster. No distributed computation has taken place. Um, finally, you, you say, OK, I, I have this uh, logical flow of uh, how to transform a data set. Now I want to ask it a question. I want to uh, count the number of elements in it. Um, and as soon as you do that, Spark uh, <clears throat> gets its act together. It marshals all of its uh, resources and says, I'm going to execute this. Uh, to execute that, to execute what Spark calls an action, um, it creates a job. Um, <clears throat> a Spark job is composed of a bunch of stages. Um, and each stage is composed of a bunch of tasks. Within each stage, you're running uh, the, same, the same program, the same kind of computation, uh, on a bunch of different pieces of data. And each task is uh, the, uh, the, the little bit of execution that's running that, um, that, that, same, that same program on a little bit of the data, on one of the partitions, uh, as, as we saw earlier. Um, so you'll have one stage. It'll uh, compute a bunch of stuff on each partition of the data through all of its tasks. Uh, and then its outputs will possibly go to another stage, which will, uh, which will compute other stuff. Um, so how do you decide? How do you go from a program like this and decide uh, what, what your stages are going to be? What the heck is a stage? Um, <clears throat> It's not, it's not that, spoiler alert. So, 
So, so here's a sort of simple, simple Spark program. Again, we're, we're taking um, a text file in a persistent storage. We're defining some sort of transformation on it. Uh, we're defining a, a filter on that. And it, it creates this um, sort of linear pipeline of operators. Um, suppose uh, at the same time, we want to do sort of the, the same thing, um, but on a di different data set. And here we're saying, let's read some file in some arbitrary uh, format normally used to uh, store files in Hadoop. Um, let's do some sort of grouping. Um, so uh, in, in Spark, a group by key is you say, um, take all of the, you, you assume that every <clears throat> uh, element in your data set is a, uh, is a key value pair. And you want to put everything with the same key next to each other so, so you can do something and act on all the values that correspond to, to a particular key. Um, Let's say, for example, you're trying to count all the um, count the number of occurrences of words in a corpus, and you want <clears throat> your key would be the word, and you put all the stuff uh, with that same word next to each other. So, so here we have another sort of pipeline of transformations, um, and then and then last of all, we create this this third RDD, this third sort of logical description of what we want to do with our data um, based on the original two RDDs, uh, and then transform it again. Finally, uh, we decide we want to do something with this third RDD. We want to collect it. We want to bring it back uh, to, the, uh, to the driver, bring it back so that uh, we can look at it ourselves and maybe try to figure out what to do next. Um, <clears throat> so when we do this, Spark looks back and it says, uh, this, this, final, this final RDD, this final map, what are all of the operations that we need to uh, compute to compute our final result? Um, and it looks at this, uh, <clears throat> this big, it's called a DAG, a, a directed acyclic graph of operators. And <clears throat> these are all the operators that uh, the final result depends on. So, so how do we turn this, uh, this DAG of operators into a DAG, a DAG of stages? Um, a super naive approach would be to say, let's create a stage for every single one of these operators. So let's have a map stage, and uh, we'll run a bunch of tasks that uh, perform this map operation. After that, we'll send its results to a filter stage, um, run a bunch of tasks that perform the filter operation. Um, an interesting thing about map and filter is that each of those, uh, each of those transformations only uh, work on one data point. So what map does is it says, let's take every uh, data point in our data, data set and then apply some function to turn it into another data point. Um, Filter says, let's take every uh, data set in our data set um, and uh, apply some sort of predicate. Um, and if it passes the test, uh, let it go through. Uh, otherwise, uh, don't let it go through. So, so, so the, the interesting thing about these, these uh, map and filter uh, operations is that um, the output of them only depends on the uh, uh, subset of data that was in the same partition as them. Um, on the contrary, you have these uh, transformations like group by key. Um, <clears throat> the crazy thing about group by key is uh, for a particular output record, which is a key and all the values that correspond to that key in the, in the input data set, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the input records that, uh, that, that lead to it, that determine that output record, uh, could reside in partitions all the way um, in different wide parts of the cluster. Um, in a bunch of different partitions. So, so to be able to actually do this computation and uh, produce the output of this uh, group by key transformation, you need to do what Spark calls uh, a shuffle. You need to figure out um, which pieces of data need to go uh, next to each other and which partitions. And then you need to uh, do this big uh, operation where you send a bunch of data across the network um, and match things up that should go, should, that should go with each other. So, so the, the places that you need to uh, define the boundaries of stages and how you figure out what goes in a stage uh, is based on these shuffle operations. So, so here's the stage overlay of, of what this job looks like. Um, our uh, reading the text file, applying our map transformation, or filter transformation can all go in one stage because you can basically uh, pipeline these operations uh, within a partition. Um, when we hit this group IQ over here, we have to define a stage boundary because uh, we want to run this, uh, this bit of uh, dis uh, distributed computation. We want to run this uh, shuffle procedure. Uh, and same here when we join data sets. Um, the output of the join could come from a bunch of, a bunch of different places. 
Um, so, so Spark is uh, really nice and figures this out for us so we don't have to do that um, and, uh, and keeps going. So, so uh, in a stage, we have a bunch of tasks as we talked about earlier. Um, sometimes when you run a task, it will, it will fail. There are lots of different reasons a task could fail. Uh, the node that it's running on could lose power, it could die. Um, you could hit some sort of uh, exception from user code. So if a task fails once, Spark will uh, say, okay, maybe it was like some sort of freak occurrence. Let's, let's try it again. Um, if a task fails four times, Spark thinks uh, it's probably not Spark's fault. It's probably the task's fault. Um, or at least it's not a random occurrence. So, so at that point, uh, Spark will say we can't uh, get this task to complete. Uh, without this task completing, we can't get this stage to complete. And without the stage uh, completing, we can't complete this job that we were trying uh, in the first place that triggered it. Um, so that's where we get this message that we saw uh, before. Uh, this job was aborted because the stage was aborted. Uh, the stage died because the task died. Um, and the task, uh, after, after this sort of confusing bit, uh, it shows us the uh, exception that caused the task failure. Uh, in this case, this was my fault. I tried to divide by zero. <laughs> um, pretty good reason for, uh, for, uh, for a job to fail. Uh, and here we go. How are we doing on time, Jeremy? A couple minutes. OK. Um, let's see. Let, let, let's go to some, uh, some interesting stuff. OK. Um, sometimes your job uh, does not die, but sometimes it takes a really long time. Um, and you're stuck wait, waiting for it. Um, why, why is this? Um, a couple of the reasons that this could happen. Uh, garbage collection stalls. Uh, because Spark is a uh, distributed system that runs on the Java virtual machine, uh, there's this constant thing that's happening in the background where uh, as it releases uh, resources, uh, a thread has to come and, uh, and, and pick them up and clean them up so they can be uh, reused for, for objects later in time. Um, there are a lot of ways in Spark that you can make uh, this go bad. Uh, this is a, a little snapshot from the, the Spark UI. It shows you all the tasks that were running in a particular stage. And you'll notice very suspiciously that each task here is taking you know, uh, 11 to 13 hours, but it's spending about 10 hours in garbage collection. So that's a lot of time. It's a lot of time wasted. Um, another thing that can happen, uh, too much spilling. Too much spilling uh, <clears throat> means when, uh, when data doesn't fit in memory uh, within a stage, um, Spark isn't going to fall over entirely, but what it is going to do is write out that data to disk and then come back to it later when it uh, thinks it can process it. Writing things out to disk is very uh, 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 time consuming. Um, there's all sorts of contention issues that can, uh, that can occur uh, and that will uh, lead your job to be slow. So I, I don't think we have time. There's all these in really cool, interesting reasons why this happens. Um, the one thing you should remember from this talk, if your Spark job is going slow, there's this num partitions argument, and you should just try making it bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, really, I, you know, we've gone through like uh, zillions of, uh, of, of tuning advice. There's all these like million uh, Spark configuration options that uh, that can you can use to uh, uh, make your Spark jobs not go really slow. Uh, and num partitions, uh, which you can basically set on any operation which triggers a shuffle, any all-to-all -all operation where you have these sort of uh, dependencies that are far-reaching in your data set, um, accepts a numpartitions argument, which is uh, in, the, in the output RDD, uh, the, the number of ways to, to split the data. Um, so, so if your job is going slow, make that high and see if it starts going uh, not slow. <laughs> 